on World News Tonight. Bizarre Blizzard. Blizzard in central China forces schools to be closed and flights to be grounded. Tornado emergency. Tennessee tornado killed six, including a child, and leaves dozens injured. Pleosaur discovery. Gigantic skull of sea monster Pleosaur discovered on UK's Jurassic Coast. And Christmas spirits. The Vatican illuminates its famed Christmas tree unveiling this year's nativity scene. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News. We start off this week in China. Beijing welcomed its first snowfall of the year today as heavy snow blanketed multiple regions in northern China. Snowfall led to school and road closures, public transport cancellations and flight delays in the Chinese capital Beijing and other parts of the country today. Chinese state television reported that 184 bus routes in Beijing were cancelled during morning rush hour due to the weather. On the underground lines, the city deployed more trains and additional technical staff to transport people switching from road to rail. According to the authorities, today's Russia began much earlier than usual. Authorities also closed sections of roads in the province of Hubei surrounding Beijing and in the northern provinces of Hilyanjiang, Liangying and Jiling, as well as in Inner Mongolia due to the driving snow. Express trains across the country had to reduce speed due to the weather conditions. In the central Chinese province of Henan, a snowstorm briefly paralyzed the main airport of Zhengzhou, a city with a population of 10 million. Most primary and secondary schools in the city cancelled classes. There were initially no reports of major accidents or injuries. Winter is one of the driest seasons in Beijing, which is why it does not often snow. The weather authorities forecast further snowfall in central and eastern China this week. India's Supreme Court has ruled that the government acted lawfully when it revoked the autonomy of the state of Jammu and Kashmir and brought it directly under control of the center. The Supreme Court ruling is a victory for the government of the Hindu nationalist Bharatiya Janata Party, which has been promising to revoke Article 370 for years. India's top court today upheld the government's controversial 2019 decision to revoke the special status of Jammu and Kashmir, also ruling that the disputed Muslim majority territory should regain its state designation with the local elections to be held next year. In the Supreme Court judgment, Chief Justice D.Y. Chandrachud said, quote, restoration of the statehood shall take place at the earliest as soon as possible, as he directed the country's election commission to hold polls in Jammu and Kashmir by the end of September 2024. Claimed in its entirety by both India and Pakistan, the mountainous Kashmir region has been at the epicenter of an often violent territorial struggle between the nuclear-armed neighbours for more than 70 years. The region is one of the world's most dangerous flashpoints, and a de facto border called the Line of Control divides the areas overseen by New Delhi and Islamabad. Four years ago, Prime Minister Narendra Modi's ruling Bharatiya Janata Party scrapped Article 370, a constitutional provision that granted special status to former state including the power to have its own constitution, flag and autonomy over all matters, save for certain policies areas such as foreign affairs and defence. Just days later, India's parliament voted to split Jammu and Kashmir into two union territories, a highly contentious move that gave New Delhi greater control over the disputed region. Meanwhile, the remote mountainous region of Ladakh, previously a part of Jammu and Kashmir, was turned into a standalone territory. Parts of the disputed region are claimed by both India and China. The Supreme Court stated that the reclassification of Ladakh was also upheld. Revoking Kashmir's special status was one of Modi's key promises during his 2019 general election campaign and the Supreme Court verdict comes just after months before he is expected to run again for a rare third time. Over in Dubai at COP28, negotiators are struggling to narrow their differences over the fossil fuel phase-out. International organizations stress the world is still off track to limit global warming despite pledges from climate talks in Dubai. At this year's annual UN Climate Summit, COP28, the crux of negotiations is the phased withdrawal of fossil fuel use. The conference is set to end on December 12th, but countries are clashing over the draft of adaptation goals. Everywhere. Some 80 countries have been able to reach consensus on the phasing out of all carbon-emitting fossil fuels. And the UAE, playing host this year, is rolling up its sleeves with high-ranking officials from attending countries to draw up an agreement. It is our opportunity to deliver an outcome that is 
based on the science, led by the science, and equipped by the science. This, however, is facing strong opposition, led by some of the world's biggest carbon emitters, Russia, Saudi Arabia, and China. These countries claim that the conference should only focus on reducing climate pollution, not the fossil fuels causing it. OPEC also openly opposed the formalization of a phased withdrawal and reduction of fossil fuels and emphasized the need for a realistic approach to solving the climate crisis. There is no single solution or path to achieve a sustainable energy future. We need realistic approaches to tackle emission. This has prompted wide criticism of OPEC and oil companies, among those advocating for the cutting of carbon emissions by reducing carbon fuels. OPEC and the oil companies right now are trying to whitewash the um, crisis that has been created by fossil fuels. The International Energy Agency, in its report released on Sunday, said new pledges to be made at the climate summit are indeed positive but will not be enough. The IEA said the world is still off track to meet climate targets to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, despite pledges made by dozens of countries. Climate activists symbolically releasing fluorescent substances into the Grand Canal in Venice, Italy, called for action on climate change. Meanwhile, Azerbaijan will host next year's event, COP29, on the back of support from Eastern European nations from November 11th to 22nd. Tennessee declared a state of emergency after a long track tornado cut right through neighborhoods just north of Nashville. Deadly tornadoes and severe storms leaving a trail of destruction across the southern U.S. At least six killed, including a two-year-old boy and dozens more injured, after an outbreak of over 25 reported tornadoes across the region. This tornado blowing through northern Nashville, damaging electrical equipment, igniting a massive explosion. Oh, my God. Officials say three people in that same neighborhood were killed, including that two-year-old and his mother, after the winds blew one of these mobile homes onto the other, leaving nothing but mangled wreckage. Attendees of a nearby church banquet racing to take shelter inside, the church now severely damaged. The pastor there says none of the roughly 40 people inside were hurt. We get to, to say good morning to our loved ones again. We all walked out alive. Authorities today warning damage from the storm still poses a threat. There's still a significant risk of debris in unstable structure areas. Uh, it is critical that you exercise extreme caution when you navigate through affected areas. More than 50 million Americans under flood threat with the deadly system now sweeping east, bringing torrential rains and damaging winds from northern Florida to New England. On to the Israel-Hamas war front next. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu called on Hamas to surrender now, calling it the beginning of the end of the militant group's existence. While Hamas has warned there will be no return of hostages without negotiations. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on Sunday called on Hamas to lay down their weapons and surrender, saying the Palestinian militant group's end is near. In the statement, Netanyahu said dozens of Hamas militants have surrendered over the past few days. However, Hamas has rejected the claims. Meanwhile, the Palestinian militant group says Israel will not be able to recover any of its hostages unless it engages in talks over conditional swap deals. A spokesperson for the al qassam brigades said in a statement on Sunday that Israel will not be able to recover the captives by force, adding there had been a failed attempt by the Israeli military to free one of them. He also noted that Hamas fighters had partially or fully destroyed 180 Israeli personnel carriers, tanks and bulldozers in the 10 days since fighting began after a brief seven-day ceasefire. The Israeli Prime Minister and Russian President Vladimir Putin spoke over the phone for nearly an hour on Sunday, with the Israeli leader reportedly expressing dissatisfaction with Moscow's stance in the armed conflict. 
Russia has regularly criticized Israel, including at the UN Security Council, while also hosting a Hamas delegation in late October for meetings. According to Russia's TASS news agency, Putin told Netanyahu that Moscow rejects terrorism but cannot support the dire situation of people in Gaza. Meanwhile, speaking, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says it's up to Israel and not the U.S. to decide when to end its war against Hamas in Gaza. The comments come as reports of Washington pressing on Israel to wrap up operations by the end of the year. In a show of support, Blinken defended the emergency sales of nearly 14,000 rounds of tank ammunition to Israel and called for a quick approval from Congress for more than 100 billion U.S. dollars in aid for Israel, Ukraine, and other national security priorities. Let's go in for a short commercial break. You're watching World News. Former President Donald Trump is doubling down on his comments that he would be a dictator, but only on day one if re-elected as president. For more on this story, let's dive into the road to the White House now. Donald Trump indicted for illegally trying to stay in power after the 2020 election, joking again about saying he wanted to be a dictator for a day. And you know why I wanted to be a dictator? Because I want a wall. Right? I want a wall and I want to drill, drill, drill. Trump campaigning at a New York fundraiser Saturday night, saying he hopes to exact revenge on Democrats he thinks wronged him. I only can say to Joe is be very careful what you wish for, because what you've done is a terrible thing. President Biden this weekend campaigning behind closed doors in Los Angeles, telling donors, quote, the greatest threat Trump poses is to the democracy. Biden's son this week facing new tax charges that could end up being a headache for his father's campaign if court dates coincide with the election. Hunter Biden's attorney saying it's all overblown and he paid his taxes back. According to a new Wall Street Journal poll, Trump leads Biden 47 to 43 in a hypothetical matchup. Over in Australia, the federal government says it will halve the migration intake within two years in a bid to fix the country's broken immigration system. Visa rules for international students and low-skilled workers will also be tightened under the new plan. Australia says it's tightening visa rules for international students and low-skilled workers. The country said Monday that decision could cut its migration intake in half over the next two years and fix what the government called a broken migration system. Australia had boosted its migration numbers after COVID-19 to help businesses fill staffing shortages. However, the sudden surge in students and workers ratcheted up pressure on an already tight rental market, with homelessness on the rise. Home Affairs Minister Claire O'Neill. We are going to make sure that we bring numbers back under control, that we build a better planned system around essential things like housing, and perhaps most importantly of all, that we build a program that delivers for the national interest. O'Neill said the surge was mainly driven by international students, a group that was kept out of the nation for almost two years because of the pandemic. Under the new policies, international students would need to score higher on English tests. There would also be more scrutiny if they want to prolong their stay after their studies end. The decision came after net immigration was expected to have peaked at a record 510,000 people between 2022 and 2023. Back to sustainable levels. Prime Minister Anthony Albanese over the weekend said Australia's migrant numbers needed to go back to a, quote, sustainable level. A recent survey for an Australian newspaper showed that almost two-thirds of voters said the country's migration intake was too high. Still, Australia is now one of the world's tightest labour markets and has long relied on immigration to bolster it. The Labour government has pushed to speed up the entry of highly skilled workers and smooth their path to permanent residency. The fly via Zhuai Hong Kong Bridge to Air Passenger Transfer Service, which aims to simplify customs procedures for the Zhuai Airport and Hong Kong International Airport travelers, will come into place tomorrow. 
Tomorrow marks the commencement of the fly via Zhuhai Hong Kong Bridge to Air Passenger Transfer Service designed to streamline custom procedures for travellers at Zhuhai Airport and Hong Kong International Airport. According to the new policy on the bridge to air passenger transfer service, mainland passengers can reach worldwide destinations through Hong Kong Airport by flying to the Zhuhai Airport in the neighboring Guangdong province first and then transfer to Hong Kong Airport without an entry permit through the Hong Kong Zhuhai Macau Bridge. International passengers will also be able to travel to mainland cities through the reverse process. To enhance clearance efficiency, the Hong Kong Zhuhai Macau Bridge Zhuhai Port, a multimodal passenger terminal, will provide shuttle bus services for passengers traveling to the Hong Kong Airport for transit flights. Passengers can board buses at the Zhuhai Airport and go directly to the Skypier terminal of the Hong Kong Airport after completing exit procedures and collecting the boarding passes at the port. Similarly, the incoming passengers can directly take dedicated shuttle buses at the transit terminal to Zhuhai to go through entry procedures. The transfer service will also further integrate the relevant resources in the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area city cluster in South China and leverage the bridge's central role of connecting the area, said the Deputy Director of the Board Inspection Office at the Board Inspection Station at the Hong Kong Zhuhai Macau Bridge. In the first 10 months of this year, the Hong Kong International Airport handled 31.4 million passenger entries and exits, a 9.5 time increase while flight movements nearly doubled to 218,370 compared with the same period in 2022. Presenting an ambiance reminiscent of the Mesozoic era, the skull of a colossal sea monster has been extracted from the cliffs of Dorset's Jurassic Coast. It belongs to a pleosaur, a ferocious marine reptile that terrorized the oceans about 150 million years ago. If the size of its skull doesn't shock you, maybe its teeth will. These are the fossilized remains of a deep sea monster that has scientists shaking with excitement. To find that, I think worldwide, there's hardly any specimens ever found to that level of detail. It belongs to a pliosaur, believed to have ruled the oceans around 150 million years ago. A 12 metre long killing machine with huge paddle-like limbs and a bite strength of 33,000 newtons, more than twice the crushing power of a saltwater crocodile, only outdone by the T-Rex. <laughs> Each of its 130 teeth grooved, making it easier to pierce and extract the flesh of its prey. It doesn't chew its food, it just breaks into bits. How it was discovered is just as remarkable. The tip of its snout spotted during a walk along the shoreline of Dorset's Jurassic Coast in England South. I just found something quite extraordinary. The rest had to be excavated from the cliff face above the beach. A discovery so rare, it's now the subject of an upcoming documentary featuring Sir David Attenborough. The ultimate marine predator, the pliosaur. Steve Itches and his team hope to find the rest of its skeleton thought to be hidden within these cliffs. The exact location remains a secret. It would be advantageous to do this because the opportunity is once in a lifetime. Welcome back. A fire at a small refinery in eastern Iran's Birajan Special Economic Zone caused two explosions. For more on that story and much more, let's take you around the world in the A fire at a small refinery in eastern Iran's Birajan Special Economic Zone caused two explosions. The state media said that this damage is yet to be assessed, adding that all 18 reservoirs at the refinery have caught fire. Italian fire services responded to a collision between two trains in Italy yesterday night, which left several passengers with injuries. Local media were reporting that 17 people had been injured in the crash, but none of them were considered to be serious. Voting for Egypt's 2024 presidential election began yesterday nationwide, with four candidates contesting for presidency, including incumbent President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. According to officials, Russia attacked the Ukrainian capital with eight long-range ballistic missiles before dawn today, and four people were wounded by debris after air defenses shot down the incoming salvo. Eyewitness video captures a large whale that was seen swimming in shallow waters close to a beach in Perth, Australia. According to local media reports, the whale swam away to deeper waters after about one hour. And that is all we have for you on World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we bring you updates from across the globe. If you missed any of today's programs, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other there in English. Tonight, we're leaving you in the Vatican, where they unveiled a majestic Christmas tree standing at an impressive height of 82 feet. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.